<laughs> well, Howard, uh, it starts with a laugh. It starts with a laugh. Let's report, well, it's, not, it's a comic book, but it's not a funny book, so it's a cartoon history instead of a, a comic book history. But anyway, um, this project started in late 2003. And um, Paul Buell, who was a senior lecturer at uh, Brown University, uh, was working with Steve Frazier, who is part of the American Empire Project. And they came up with an idea of turning chapter 12 of Howard's book, The, people and the Empire and the People, into a, a graphic novel or a graphic history. We couldn't turn the whole people's history of the United States because we would need an encyclopedia. So this is just one thin volume. But it's based on chapter 12. And uh, the Henry Holt and company uh, agreed to the idea. And um, we, we went to work. And the key thing that we wanted to do is that history is a very complex subject, but it, if it's going to be a graphic history, if it's going to be uh, a comic book history, that it was going to be a storybook. And Howard's book is, of course, full of great stories. And so the thing that we worked on the hardest was to make sure that this book was full of all kinds of stories told by the people. So the, the massacre at Wounded Knee is told by Black Elk, which, and it was a first-person account. And, um, and the other thing that we were going to do was that we were going to tell Howard's biography based on his book, uh, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. So I think you're the first historian who was ever turned into a cartoon character. <laughs> <laughs> and I left him speechless. No. We had, we had a little... No. We, I seem to remember that at the beginning, uh, we had a little disagreement about how I looked, right? Well, I wanted to look better and smarter and stronger, right? Uh, and uh, you had me wearing glasses all the time. I know, I know. You, and then you, we, you had me looking like an intellectual. Like a, like a professor. Like a professor, <laughs> right. <laughs> I wanted to look like a... A chalk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't, you didn't tell me that. Like, you know, cartoonists can do anything. Well, the hard part of it is, is how do you caricature somebody that you, that you respect? Because I'm a political cartoonist. I draw politicians and evil bosses. So, you know, how do you do a flattering caricature? And I, I admit that that's the hardest thing. But I did redo 60 drawings and took off your glasses. <laughs> you... you you had me with several different noses. I <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> I was astounded by the job that Mike Konopaki did. Of course, I'd never had this experience of having uh, my words put into comic form, and, and uh, yeah, the word comic doesn't quite apply, right? Cartoon, graphic. I guess the word graphic is better. Yeah, I never had this experience. And uh, I, I was in awe when Mike began sending me these pages and sending me these drawings. And I mean, do you know what a, an immense job that must have been to produce all of these drawings? I mean, I would have to spend uh, maybe an evening doing three of those, right? And uh, so uh, it, it was, uh, yeah, I, w I was enormously impressed. And, uh, I had no idea that I would get, was going to become a, a character in the, the story, but of course, w once once it was done, uh, you know how could I refuse? So, uh, but remember, I was sending you this stuff all along, so you had plenty of opportunity to say. <laughs> no, that's no, that's true. Yeah, secretly I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but what 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 I. Yeah, but I, what I loved most was that, and this is something uh, you know, a writer always worry, worries about, that when his work is being adapted in some other form, whether it's you know, adapted in some pictorial form or adapted for television or adapted f you know, in some way, uh, uh, the, the writer always worries that his ideas uh, uh, are going to be in some way distorted or his message weakened, 
and, uh, and what uh, really made me feel very comfortable when Mike started sending me these pages is that uh, he was giving an absolutely unflinching picture of my ideas. Nothing, uh, nothing was being diluted. In fact, sometimes he scared me with his radicalism. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, but I, I accepted it. Uh, and uh, the, 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 yeah, they, they did a, w a wonderful job, I think, doing justice to the ideas uh, in the book and, and giving it a kind of form which we hope will appeal to uh, people who maybe are daunted by uh, a people's history of the United States, daunted by a 600 or 700 page book which has nothing but words. <laughs> uh, so I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, the Brattle Theater and uh, which, as many of you know, is a sort of historic place for odd things to happen. Uh, I, I, I remember during the Vietnam War, the Brattle Theater turning over this space to meetings against the war. I remember sitting on this stage at an anti-war meeting with I.F. Stone, and, uh, and, uh, and that gave me the first inkling that the Brattle Theater was a, a very uh, unusual kind of enterprise. So I want to thank the Brattle, thank the Huck, yeah. <laughs> thank the Harvard Bookstore, of course, and thank uh, Metropolitan Books, thank Mike Mapaki, thank my friends who are here. I think all of you are my friends. I was looking for somebody here who was not my friend. <laughs> I'm still looking. Okay. Uh, but we, uh, I mean, basically the idea is, we, of course, we want, we want this book uh, to give, a spe by the graphics, to give a special vividness and a special excitement to the ideas that we think are so important, especially at this point in American history when it's not only the war in Iraq that we want people to think about, because a lot of people obviously in this country more and more have begun to think about the war in Iraq and, and have been appalled at what they have learned. And we know now that 70, 80 percent of the American people are opposed to the war in Iraq. But the idea of this book is not just to make people think about what is going on right now in Iraq, but the idea is to think beyond that uh, because after our troops are withdrawn from Iraq, there may be another attempt to send troops elsewhere. In fact, you hear people saying, you hear somebody saying, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but there are presidential candidates who are saying, well, maybe we ought to take troops out of Iraq and send them to Afghanistan. Uh, no, we want in this book, as I've wanted in, in, in my book, A People's History, uh, we want people to understand that uh, the, this war, that war, the other war, are part of a very long and persistent pattern in uh, American behavior in the world. So that people are prepared not just to oppose this war or that war or the other war, but that people begin to get the idea that war itself needs to be abolished. That no longer, at this point in human history, no longer can we accept the idea that war, which is always the indiscriminate killing of huge numbers of innocent people, that war, no longer can we accept the idea that war is a solution for any of the problems we have in the world. That's what we want people to think about. Uh, the reason that we use um, the preamble is basically based on an article that Howard wrote for the Progressive Magazine for November of 2001, so it was the issue right after 9-11, and it's called The Old Way of Thinking, and the scary part is that in his 
article in the Progressive Howard predicted all the stuff that was going to happen, and basically it, it happened again. And so Afghanistan and Iraq were a predictable reactions and predictable behavior. And, um, but the key thing was is that uh, this isn't a, um, an aberration or something new, that it's also part of a continuum, and that's the idea behind a, the people's history of American empire, is that when, it, when the United States started becoming an empire, and this includes manifest destiny, this includes the colonization of the West or the colonization of uh, the native people in, in the continental North America, that empire began when, we, when the United States started moving west, and once it, it stopped at the uh, Pacific Ocean, they, had, they wanted to leap over the ocean and continue, and that was part of uh, what expansionism was all about. Um, there are a lot of books that we have in the bibliography that, that f basically um, I had to read in order to get a sense of all the source material and whatever that we were using. And there's a great book, and if you have a chance to find it, it's called The Forbidden Book. And it's uh, Abe Ignacio and a number of Filipinos in the Bay Area put out this book, and it's a collection of American political cartoons done in the 1890s and the early 1900s. And it's all based on the, uh, the invasion of the Philippines and the, and the U.S. colonization of the Philippines. And when I read that book and I read chapter 12 and I realized the connection, the parallels between the Philippine invasion and the Iraq war are striking. I mean, they're scary. They even had a controversy about torture. Back then it was called the water cure. And today it's called the water, it's called water boarding. But it's a, it's a water torture nonetheless. One of the books in the American Empire Project uh, is written by Alfred McCoy. It's, it's a history of CIA torture. And he's a history professor at the University of Wisconsin. And he talks about how torture is basically a part of the, of the, of the American military machine and it has been used um, th throughout American expansionism. And, and I think it was John McCain was asked one time um, why Japanese soldiers were imprisoned for using waterboarding after World War II, but it's okay for Americans, and apparently because we're better torturers than the Japanese or something. I, I, but just the whole idea is that this is not something new, that this has been done. People have been prosecuted for torture for this very same technique. And, that, that, and now we have memos that just came out a couple of weeks ago that Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice, Gonzalez, even uh, Powell were all in on the meeting where they said we're going to be using torture tactics. And the sad part of it is, is that we're not a country of laws, we're a country of men, so these people are going to get away with it. Hopefully, I mean, the, the only threat, I guess, is that if somebody goes outside the country, might, they might get arrested like Pinochet did when he was in, in uh, England. But um, these, these torturers are in our midst and they're going to get away with it, even though they violated international law, they violated uh, U.S. law. And will uh, Hillary Clinton, will Barack Obama, will uh, John McCain, who is a victim of torture himself, will they prosecute people for that? Probably not. But that's the, that's the tragedy. But it's also important for us to realize that what we're doing now isn't something new. But like Howard said, at what point do we stop doing that? Because it's the same old way of thinking. I was, uh, I must say that I didn't really plan this book the way it's been arranged and organized. Um, and uh, I was very glad to see that it starts off with 9-11 uh, and, and then goes back in, into the history. Because I, I've always believed that the best way to teach history is not chronologically, uh, but to start with the present and then to go back into the past in order to illuminate uh, what you face in the present. Uh, and 
uh, because I always remembered how it was when uh, I was studying history, how they, um, it was all chronological, it would always start, you know, well, it'd start with Egypt, <laughs> well, it'd start with, uh, or, or yeah, they might start with Columbus, yes, and then they'd move up, and the, te the, the teacher uh, at the beginning of the class uh, would say, why do we study history? We study the past in order to understand the present. And then they would never get to the present. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I decided, no, that's, that's no way to study history. And, uh, and, and so starting with 9-11, with which everybody has been concentrating on now for years, and then moving back in history to understand really the roots of 9-11, which lie in the history of American foreign policy. I thought that was a, a, a great thing to do, among other in, insights that you had. Yeah. Well, what we tried to do is that when you're doing a graphic book, number one, you, it has to be a storybook, but number two, we have to have a thread that runs through the whole thing. So then, of course, Howard being that thread, uh, we decided, well, what does Howard do? He speaks before a crowd. He, he talks about this. And, and I went to, to see him speak a couple of times in Madison. And um, so I thought, well, that would be the perfect place for him to start because now he can tell stories. And, of course, a people's history is full of great stories. So, um, so we also had, because we were limited, even 288 pages is long, but we were limited because we, we had to do representational stories. So what would be a good story to represent the colonization of the West? Well, there, uh, Black Elk wrote a memoir of his uh, experience at Wounded Knee, and I think it was done in the 1930s. And so that was going to be the representational story. And so then Black Elk tells that story. And then the, the interesting part of history is that you use actual photographs, you use actual graphics from the period as evidence and also um, to, you, to bring that stuff in and, and to display that in the history. And so when we have photos of the actual grave where, where the uh, uh, people were burying the frozen dead after, this after the battle there was a huge blizzard it was so cold, and then by the time they got there to bury the dead, the bodies are all stiff. We have a, a picture of Bigfoot frozen stiff. And then they just made a mass grave. And so we have, and that was actually a media circus because Hearst and Pulitzer sent wagon loads of reporters and photographers. So we found all kinds of archival photos, and uh, Frederick Remington was there drawing uh, pictures of it. So the, it was a media event, and like I th think it was a third of the U.S. military was at Wounded Knee at that time. And so we found a lot of really great archival uh, cartoons, graphics, uh, and photos that give evidence to what, what was going on. I'm going to mention one thing. Um, on page 73, we have, and it was in the video, and here's a picture of the U.S. military standing on the bodies of the dead at the Moro Massacre. And this is based on uh, Voices of a People's History, where Howard has Mark Twain telling the, the story of the Moro Massacre, how they massacred 900 uh, uh, Moro tribespeople from the southern part of the Philippines, and they're Muslims. And they resisted the Spanish, they resisted the Filipinos, they re resisted the, um, the Americans as empire. And they uh, escaped to the, a extinct volcano crater, and General Leonard Wood, who became the uh, governor general of, uh, of the Philippines, kind of like the Paul Bremer of his day, he was also a medical doctor, a surgeon, had his troops r r r um, around the rim of the, of the uh, volcano and just blasted everybody with cannon and, and, and small arms. And there was a, uh, a historian named Jim Zwick who did a great book on Mark Twain and the Anti-Imperialist League. And he, the last 10 years of his life, he spent fighting the Philippine occupation. And so we found the photo, and, and uh, unfortunately, Jim just passed away not too long ago, but, but, but he sent me a really high-resolution photo. And so this is kind of like, the, this is the evidence that we have that needs to be seen. 
And so it's, that's the kind of stuff that is... Uh, that made this book a lot of fun because we found old pictures of American troops uh, torturing people with the water cure. So, you know, there's, this evidence is out there. And so it was just a lot of fun to, to I mean, Google image search is amazing. <laughs> you can find all kinds of stuff. And once you can, can guarantee that it's not on Wikipedia, that it's actually, that you can find an original source for it and you've got you've got the evidence, then that's what we did in this book is we put in a lot of evidence of actual photos of, of things that we came across. And um, I think it adds, adds to the power of the book because you know, we're trying to show that this is, these are the things that actually happened. I think we wanted it at a certain point, and I've just chosen the point, <laughs> to uh, turn things over to the audience. And uh, whatever, whatever comments or questions uh, you have, okay? Uh, who, are you, uh, who is going to... We can't actually see people very well, <laughs> but... Uh, I think, I think people in the anti-war movement, I'm, the anti-war movement consists of all sorts of people, and, the, and there are people who are more, uh, more inclined to engage those who protest against them, and other people who are more inclined to ignore them. And uh, in, in this particular case, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that the people who are picketing the house where the Winter Soldier gatherings taking place. I'm not even sure they were veterans, but in fact there were uh, veterans who were part of the Winter Soldier campaign who left the house where we were having this meeting and went outside and did in fact try to talk and, and engage uh, the people who were picketing. Uh, what they discovered was that the people who were picketing were not people from the neighborhood or people from the area, but people who had been flown in and, <laughs> and uh, as part of some organized, some, there's some organized task force which uh, goes around and, 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 and tries to find places where anti-war meetings are taking place and set up uh, picket lines. But the, the basic idea that you're, you're expressing I think is a good one. And as we want to, we want to engage people, we want to talk to people, uh, uh, we want to raise questions in their minds, which even if they don't have any immediate effect, may, may cause them to think. I mean, that's, and that's part of how an anti-war movement grows. Uh, please, I would like you to help me answer a question. Um, at this point in this world, we need all to live together and fight like global warming and other challenging things. There was the cartoons uh, of the uh, the cartoons that uh, uh, brought a lot of Muslims down the streets uh, about the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, I was myself torn between the respect for Islam as a religion with its upside and down a downside like any other religion the freedom of speech. And I couldn't find an answer whether this is the right thing or not. But I mean, for sure it's it made a lot of people angry and a lot of people frustrated. So would you help me answer the question? One day, one uh, the, that, you're talking about the Danish cartoons that, were, that came out, I think it was a couple of years ago. Uh, the University of Wisconsin had two forums on the Danish cartoons because the Muslim community in Madison was very outraged by it. And so um, there were a lot, there were two large groups that were discussing the whole thing. And I went online and I found all of them. 
and I printed them out, and I went to these discussions, and I was waiting to see what people were talking about, and it turns out that virtually nobody else had seen anything other than one cartoon. And so information-wise, I thought this was really kind of tragic because now the newspapers are afraid to publish them and you can't even talk about it because now it's not even a news... I mean, it's not to be treated as a news story. And as a political cartoonist, I, I had to defend the right of the cartoonist to do this because, I mean, it, it is freedom of speech. And so then you have to create a dynamic. You have to have, have a, a push and pull of ideas. But when I finally saw all of the cartoons, I realized maybe there are one and two that were actually insulting, but the other ones were, some were funny, some were showing a cartoonist drawing, looking over his shoulder because it was a, a question of fear. And the only person that did a really good um, analysis was uh, Art Spiegelman, the guy who uh, did the, um, the, the book Mouse, which was the uh, story of his parents surviving Auschwitz. And he did it, I think it was in Harper's Magazine, and he went down and he talked to every one of the artists and he, they printed the cartoon and he explained what the cartoon was about because you know, they weren't in English, so you, he, they had to be translated. And had that been part of the discussion at the University of Wisconsin when people were talking about this, I think it would have been more of an educational experience than it was. Basically, people were angry. And the thing that wasn't told was that there were Yemeni uh, reporters that were actually thrown in jail because they reported on the story. There was an Egyptian editor who actually, they ran the story in an Egyptian paper months before the, it blew up. And so there were actual, uh, there were Arab journalists who may still be in jail for acting like journalists, for trying, and this is before uh, it, it became, um, a worldwide event, these people had already been trying to publish this stuff in Arab papers. And so to say that even uh, Muslim people were reading about it and knew about it and were discussing it already, to say that you can't talk about it was, after that it was, it was too late because that's where the discussion had already begun. And so, uh, I, you know, I guess more speech is better because if we tell people to shut up and don't talk about this, number one, you're not going to learn about it. If Art Spiegelman hadn't had the guts to go out and actually do reporting, and this is after the American press refused to publish these because they were afraid, he actually did the reporting and, and found out. And the interesting thing is, is that the bomb that was used for the, for, uh, the, the turban that has the, the... Well, it turns out that that bomb is kind of like an American political cartoon icon because it was that bomb, that round ball with a fuse in it, that is part of the lore of uh, the Haymarket tragedy in Chicago in 1886 because was, those are the kind of bombs that they used at that time. So that you don't see a round black ball with a fuse coming out of it. But when you see it in a cartoon, it actually dates back to 1886 in Chicago. You know, so it was, it was almost part of American political cartoon history because a lot of those cartoons, anti-anarchist cartoons, were published in the press during the 1880s around the Haymarket that used that icon. So there's so much to know about this. And that whole discussion, uh, I think, suffered because nobody talked about it. I was wondering, do you think this book would be suitable for children? Well, the, hard, the, the question was, do, uh, do we think that this book is suitable for children? Um, recently, you had a, a young people's version of a people's history printed. Yeah, and there was a great review in the New York Times that said it didn't talk down to anybody, but it talked to people, and I'm that's what we're hoping that this, because I don't think we dumbed this down at all. I mean, we didn't have uh, English teachers that would tell us, well, this is the kind of language that you need for eighth grade for high school, and so we didn't have that kind of guidance. But um, the woman that helped write and edit some of the stories. Her name is Kathy Wilkes, is a, a labor writer and a labor editor. 
She's so efficient, and, and she was able to, to squeeze every word that wasn't necessary and put, because we were based, basing everything on, on dialogue balloons. And so I, I hope that kids can use it, and I hope that history teachers can use it. Not, you know, this is the, isn't the be all and end all, but it should be part of the discussion, and I hope that it's accessible to young people. But I don't think it should be limited. I think it should, I mean, the interesting thing about the United States is that comics are, history comics and comics about political issues seems to be relatively new. Worldwide, this is an ancient form. People are using this all over the world, and uh, so we're just learning about it now in the last 20, 30 years. But this is a form that's used in Europe, South and Central America, Asia, Africa, all the time. So this is, um, graphic histories are for everybody. I suspect that when uh, somebody asks, is this suitable for young people, well, it could mean two things. <laughs> it could mean, uh, will young people be able to read this and understand it? And, and I suspect maybe that was behind that question. But sometimes uh, people ask, is it suitable for young people? In the same way that people used to ask me about a people's history of the United States, is it suitable for young people? And what they meant was, should we really expose young people <laughs> to uh, Christopher Columbus as a torturer, a murderer, a kidnapper? Should we expose them to Andrew Jackson uh, and Theodore Roosevelt for what they are, bloodthirsty killers? <laughs> should we, should we, yeah, are, are, are these kids too young? for that. And of course, my, my response to that was, look at what kids see on television. Look at what they see in the movies. But aside from that, the, the fundamental thing is we have to be honest with young people. You can choose the language in which you use in order to present something to young people, but young people should know the truth about their history. They should be spared nothing. We, we don't want them to learn myths growing up until they, you know, get to be of the right age to finally be told the truth. So, uh, yeah, for, as Mike said, yeah, we think it's suitable in several different ways for young people. Uh, um, a lot has been written about art, including you, Howard, art and political struggle. Do, do you know any <coughs> references on specifically political cartoons and, and political activism and struggle and the connections? Well, we only have a half an hour left. <laughs> well, I'm a student of, of American political cartooning, and I think one of the things that I discovered uh, early on was um, I'm from Wisconsin, and there was a cartoonist who grew up in Monroe, Wisconsin. His name was Art Young. And he became famous uh, as one of the cartoonists for the masses in uh, New York during not, from 1911 to 1917. Art Young uh, became, was a cartoonist in Chicago, and he worked with Thomas Nast at the Chicago Inner Ocean. And he did the definitive sketches of the Haymarket um, anarchists when they were in jail. And he did pamphlets opposing them. And uh, years later, when he became a socialist, he, he regretted having done that. But there are a number of books that, on, about art and politics, and especially if you study the cartoonists and the magazine, The Masses. I mean, if you can go online and find from the University of Michigan, I think they have some of the covers of The Masses. I think they have all of them digitized, and they're gorgeous. And they're John Sloan, who was one of the uh, famous painters, he was one of the eight in New York in the early uh, part of the, the 20th century. Robert Miner, one of the definitive cartoonists that used crayon, it, it, he was probably, his artwork influenced Bill Malden and, and, and um, Herb Locke because it was the, the, the crayon on, on coarse paper. And so the cartoonists of the masses were really influential on me because when I was reading about them, it was just, that's the kind of stuff I wanted to do. And I mean, there's a lot of really, I mean, the political cartooning in the United States has a, a long history of, of just some amazing stuff. We have a, a little slideshow called The Incomplete History of American, of, a, of Labor Cartooning. 
and Gary Huck and I show this when we go to labor conferences, and it's amazing to find some of the old communist cartoons, some of the old anti-communist cartoons, um, but American political cartooning has a long uh, anti-war tradition, anti-left tradition. Can I just say a little, because I, I wasn't clear, is there anything about the connection, the use of these cartoons in, by political movements? Do, do you know what I mean? Not well, look at the, look at the anti-war movement in the 60s. I mean, all the graphics, all the underground newspapers, that was political cartooning and, and political art. And they're actually, uh, there's going to be a show in, uh, at the University of Wisconsin next year uh, put on by Dennis Kitchen, who's responsible for Kitchen Sink Press. And they're going to have all these cartoons, underground comics. I mean, granted, most of them were, were pornographic, but there were a lot of it had to do with politics. And um, you know, so that was in the, in, the, in the 60s. But look at EC Comics. Now this is in the in the uh, 40s and the 50s when William Gaines. Uh, I heard Art Spiegelman speak about EC Comics, and they were all written by Jewish writers, drawn by Jewish cartoonists. And if you look at Tales of the Crypt and uh, Vault of Horror and all this stuff, according to Art Spiegelman, they were basically anti-Holocaust. They were Holocaust revenge fantasies because the dead always come back to torment their, their killers. And so that was a, a political movement. And that was, even, that was shut down by the government because they said that it uh, um, led to juvenile delinquency. <laughs> but then what did Bill Gaines do? He started Mad Magazine, which was a political... It, that was a political response to having the EC Comics shut down. When are we going to get another article from you in the Boston Globe? I've been waiting for years. Maybe, I, maybe you put one in since the last one, which I saw years ago called What Good Old Days. It was a response to George Will's reactionary views. It was brilliant. In fact, I wrote a letter praising it that got published in the Globe. So well, that was a problem, you see. You wrote a letter praising my <laughs> column, and, uh, and they never asked me for one again. <laughs> the usual pap that gets uh, passive for political discussion in the papers is just so uh, unsatisfying. And I was just wondering if, you, if you've been boycotted by them. What, what's the story? The, uh, it's not easy to get an op-ed piece published in a mainstream newspaper. Uh, what I'm grateful for is that uh, there are some regular columnists whose appearance in the paper make me, makes me feel uh, okay. Uh, they're not publishing my op-ed pieces. But for instance, in the Boston Globe, you know, there are one or two columnists uh, who are regularly turning out sharp, strong, and eloquent columns. Uh, James Carroll is one of them, and Derek Jackson is another. And in the, in the Times, uh, you have Herbert who, uh, will, you know, provide at least some counterweight to the general run of Times op-ed people. And, uh, but uh, you learn a lot about freedom of the press and the free marketplace of ideas when you try to place an, an op-ed in an establishment newspaper which runs counter uh, to the, what is called the traditional wisdom, the conventional wisdom. It's, it's not, but uh, I like the idea of people writing letters to the editor. I think more people should write letters to the editor. I find that uh, uh, I turn to the letters to the editor before I turn to the columnists very often. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, a good way for a person who doesn't have the kind of sort of, you might, standing that would cause a a major newspaper to publish his or her op-ed piece, but, but has something really important to say. Uh, I think letters to the editor are sort of a very good way for people uh, to get their uh, ideas into mainstream newspapers. So I would encourage more, more of you to, to do that uh, as much as you can. Back to what was, you know, what 
is appropriate for um, kids, and I guess I might be considered a kid, I'm 18, but I just want to know, um, I think being born in the 1990s, um, I think we're really the first generation to have generation, what we should get out of this, what you thought was important for my generation. Uh, are, you, are you asking, what is the most important thing for people of your generation? Yeah, what we should carry with us, with all this truth, um, especially I, uh, I, I think maybe the most important thing for you to, uh, for this coming generation, the present generation, for young people, the most important thing for them to understand is that even as they learn the sordid history of empires, the American empire and all the other empires, and, e and even as they, they learn to see through the lies and delusions uh, spread by the rich and the powerful, uh, the most important thing for them to learn is that there have always been people in history who have resisted these lies. There have always been people who have opposed what was going on. There, there's, there have always been dissenters. There's always been a kind of underground. And, and at certain points in history, uh, these dissenters will uh, grow, and they grow, and they grow to the point where they become a social movement and then something changes. And therefore, the most important thing for anybody to learn, I think, is that uh, they should not be silent or, or despondent in the face of overwhelming power, but they should understand, people really should understand that we all have a power uh, if we persist, if we join other people, uh, if we don't give up. Uh, we, we all have a power, which at certain points in history becomes great enough so that the most powerful governments, the most powerful corporations cannot withstand it and they must yield. We've seen this happen in history and it can happen again. Thank you, Dr. Zinn. Thank you, Mr. Konopaki. We're going to have the book signing here at the front of the hall. I'm going to ask that everyone lines up down this aisle and around the back. If you're exiting the hall, please exit to my left, your right. Copies of the book are for sale at the back of the hall. And thank you all again for coming this evening.